depending on the promises.
time in our pulpit. And uh, just praise the Lord for the halls and for their wanting to follow the Lord in the service to Him and the training for the ministry. And so this morning, I welcome Derek to the pulpit of the Little Baptist Church. Get settled at your piece of those that you prepare the message. I think we're there. Um, before we get into it, it's actually really interesting. I actually explained it this way, but didn't say anything. Usually when Mr. Harvard calls me, asks if there's any specific music I want. And actually, if you if you have your red hymnal book there, if you'll turn it to 466, that's actually what I was going to open with today. So um, I did not pass for that. So I'm glad it worked out that way. 466. We just sang it as a congregation. So I'm just going to read through the verses. That's actually what I had kept on my notes to open with this is to kind of prepare our hearts. And I love when the Holy Spirit moves and God moves in ways to, to align. I think it's a pretty good uh, indication um, that this is a message that's laid on my heart. And I like that when the music's already prepare our hearts to receive a message like this. I'm just going to read through the verses and then the verse. We're going to start in the chorus. Once far from God and then in sin, no light my heart could see. But in God's word, the light I found, now Christ liveth in me. As rays of light from yonder sun, the flowers of earth set free. So life and light and love come forth from Christ living in me. As, lot, as lives the flower within the sea, as in the, the coma tree, so praise the God of truth and grace, his spirit, love in me. With longing, all my heart is filled that like him I may be, as on the wondrous thought I dwell that Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Oh, what a salvation this, that Christ liveth in me. I love that song. And uh, it lends up very well to the part of the message. You'll notice that I that I read it, I did not sing it. And sometimes I read because I think sometimes if we take a little bit longer and think about the words a little more slowly, if we read it without singing, it sort of affects our heart a little, sometimes a little bit of a different way. But truthfully, I don't sing because we went out to lunch after this, and now we're reading that today, that words. So um, that's part of it. But if you have an outline there, um, you'll, you'll see the title of the message is Professed, but not possessed. Professed, but not possessed. And what I mean by that, by the professed part, is people who claim to have made a profession of faith. People who claim to be saved. People who maybe can remember um, getting baptized, or giving a testimony, or going before someone and saying, yes, I've been saved. Okay, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about that word professed. Professed but not possessed. And what I mean by that word possessed is what we just read about, what we just sang about and read about in that hymn. The Holy Spirit's actual possession and indwelling in our lives. Because truthfully, there's a big difference between, between being a professed Christian and actually one who has been yielded their life to the Lord and submitted and is currently living in a state of being possessed and indwelled with the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're going to look at today. So let's open with, with, with a word of prayer. Right, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much. Thank you for the time that we've had um, already this morning in music to prepare our hearts. So we thank you for the many ways, God, that you allow us to praise you, God, for worship to you, and playing instruments and singing songs. And now, Lord, I pray that you accept our praise to you as we study your word. We preach forth the word that you've given us from your Bible. And just pray that you'll help us apply it to our hearts, God. And it will come forth with a sweet holy savior and dear friends. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we would all probably agree, of all the differences we have here, we live in a, a strange world. Uh, the generation we live in right now, the society we live in, we are presented with challenges that no other generation here before has ever had to deal with. Um, I'm 34 years old, and I can, I can guarantee you, when I was going to school, it was never a question which bathroom I was going to go into. 
It was never an indication of when I go to Walmart, do I, when I was like, well, I, I can remember as a kid going to Walmart or going to Walmart, and my parents could let me walk into a bathroom or go up in the store and meet up at the food court or something later on. Right now, I don't let the girls out of my sight if we're somewhere in public and put people around. We don't know. We live in a different world. Soci society is changing just at such a, a fast pace around us. And you, um, during the week, Monday through Friday, I, mean, I get up before, I get up relatively early um, and you know, do my prayer and my Bible reading, and then I go to the gym and work out before I go to work. Um, and while I'm at the gym, usually they have the, on the ellipticals anyway, they have the, um, the, the TV is kind of preset. So they've got one station over here with the news on. This one might have, you know, old westerns is always on one of them, and there's another one that's just kind of like headlines, like one minute headlines that, that rotate for. And I, I tuned in one day because I was paying attention, and they were doing interviews on the streets in one of the news channels. And they asked, they went through a bunch of different people, old, young, different races, different nationalities. Some were born in America, some that were they, born in Europe and moved here. And they asked them, if you, had to, if you had to describe the current state of living in America, what is the one word you would use? Okay, if we're going to say here, we could probably come up with a lot of things like worry, troublesome, anxiety, all these different things. But the, the only word that got repeated out of the 10 people that they, um, that they brought up was unrest. I think there were about 10 people that they actually televised and three of them said unrest. And this was a few weeks ago when everybody was kind of wondering what's going on with North Korea and you know, all the health insurance debates. And that word unrest was the one that people kind of settled on to they kind of encapsulates everything that's going on in our society. This, we, we, everybody just always seems a little bit on edge or anxious about everything that's going on. Um, we've got to a point in our society where there's this strange, almost glorification of, of anarchy and rebellion, to the point where people are openly um, rebelling against police and authority. And, almost like it's this noble thing that we should be uh, striving to achieve. Where 1 Timothy 2.2 2 tells us that it should be our goal to lead quiet and peaceable lives. And those of us that are saved, and here today I'm going to be speaking mostly to those of us here that are saved. And those of you that are saved, that the only true source of peace, to live quiet and peaceable lives, the only true source of peace in our lives is Jesus Christ. That's why it's so, it's so strange to me, um, when people who profess to be Christians kind of turn their back on God and kind of walk away from, from the, the truth, the true source of peace in their lives. And the more I thought about it, um, and this could just be me, um, but I personally don't seem to hear as much preaching about backsliding anymore. I listen to a lot of preaching. I, I, I enjoy listening to preaching. I listen to preaching. Um, during my commutes, and I drive out during the day, so I, you know, I have my podcast on, and there's different sermons that I have to listen to. So I listen to a lot of preaching, and it just seems like there's not as much discussion about, or preaching about backsliding as there was in years past. I can remember being a little, little boy growing up um, in my grandfather's church. There was, I think, three evangelists that came through every year for like week long revival meetings. And when they came through, you knew that at some point during the week they were going to hit on backsliding, get your heart right with God. That's just how it was. And it, like I said, it could just be, it's very possible, it's just me. But it almost seems like now when you, we hear about Christians that are kind of falling away, going by the wayside, it's almost like this spirit or this mentality, not so much that we're happy about it, but just kind of like this acceptance of it. Like, well, yeah, that happens. You know, it's sad, but it does happen that people. That, that walk away from the Lord. And when I talk about this, this term backsliding, the best definition I could find to summarize it is the process of someone falling back into their carnal lifestyle patterns. It is more than committing a series of sins. It involves a repeated process of falling further and further into sin with little or no signs of guilt or conviction. Okay, and, and I just put here in my own notes, in short, people who know better but don't do better. People who know better than the way that they're living, the way they're acting, the way they're speaking, the way they're conducting themselves, but don't adjust themselves to realign themselves with the truth that we're told in the Bible. 
Um, it's interesting, when I was growing up, I mentioned my grandmother's church, he, he still passes the church I grew up in, uh, not too far from here, about 40 minutes in back New York. And in the back, has been, we, we, we exited up this side of the church when we were growing up. And there's a little plaque on the, on the back of the door, and I looked for it last time I was there to make sure it was still there. It was there underneath like a, a missionary letter. But it says these words, it says, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to take you? And sadly, I think if we were going to be honest, the state of Christianity in our society today, for a lot of Christians, if they're going to answer it honestly, based on the, what, the resources we've been given in the Bible to live up to, would be not. A lot of Christians would have a very hard time proving their Christianity or their spiritual walk with Christ before a court or a judge or jury. Um, I think you probably know that I'm not really into statistics because I'm a very logical thinker. I like things that I don't like to rely on feelings, I like to rely on facts and have numbers that back them up. Um, and so much so that the most um, trusted sources for doing studies or evaluations of churches um, and things along that line have actually echoed this sentiment that so much so that it used to be when they would do a study that they would include studies of regular attendees. It used to be someone who attended church at least once a week. That's what they considered a regular attendee. Now church attendance in our country has dropped so much and the, the percentage of people who actually attend church on a weekly basis is so low. In order to do research and get the numbers that they need to know how to, to is it validate? Is it to validate? Validate their research. You say no, that is all right. To to validate their research, they actually had to extend that concept of regular attendees from once a week to once a month. That's how far we how we slip and what we are in a Christian country that's founded upon Christian principles. First Peter 2 9 says it calls us to be a, a peculiar people. Okay, that when I say that, it doesn't mean that we have to go out of our way to be weird. Okay? Um, I won't ask for a show of hands, but has anybody here ever like, met some weird Christians? Yeah, you? I, I know I have. You kind of close your eyes and pin your frame and everybody come over. And Is that better? Yeah. And, yeah, Sam, if you've ever heard. Or if you've ever been in touch with any like weird Christians. Like people kind of claim to be saved, but they're just a little out there with their, their thoughts. Um, I said like you, know, you see them come and you kind of close your eyes and you're praying so you don't have to talk to them type thing. It's, there, there's some weird some weird thoughts. But where everybody calls us in first Peter trying to be a peculiar people, it doesn't it, you know, peculiar people. It doesn't mean that we have to go out of our way to be weird. All it means is that we're peculiar, is if we're really saved, that's going to be evident in the way that we live our lives, the way that we conduct ourselves. The Holy Spirit will help us convict us and change things in our lives that are supposed to be there. And if we're trying to live for the Lord, people will notice. You don't have to wear a sign that says, you know, caution, Christian approaching. You know, that's not how our lives need to be. I hope we should come through in the way that we live our lives. But there's a problem, a big problem, if nobody outside your church or your family knows that you're saved. If the people you, you go to school with, the people you work with, the people you interact with on a daily basis, if they didn't know your spiritual background, there's a problem with your spiritual walk if they can't look at your life and tell them there's something different about it. we got to change some things. There's a quote that I like that goes along with this uh, by Octavius Winslow who says, if there is one consideration more humbling than any other to a spiritually minded believer, it is that after all God has done for him, after all the rich displays of his grace, the patience and tenderness of his instructions, the repeated discipline of his covenant, the tokens of love seen, and the lessons of experience learned, there should still exist in the heart a principle, the tendency, which is to secret, perpetual, and alarming departure from God. And those stats I mentioned earlier, how we, what we consider regular companies, has gone from once a week to once a month in less than 20 years. They've changed that for their, from a statistical standpoint for their studies. That's changed in the past 17 to 18 years that they've made that change. 
So we all kind of know people like this. Maybe people that you grew up with. I think of people that maybe you even got saved around the same time in life. People who grew up, seemed to love the Lord. People who learned memory verses. People who saw God answer prayer in their lives. Saw God heal people they love. Saw God intervene in their job situations and relationships. People who saw job, people who saw God intervene in their life in so many ways, and then hit the doors in the back to rarely, if ever, come back in. So that's why I didn't title this message to "Profess but Not Possessed." Okay, what, and what, what, again, what we're talking about is people who profess to have been saved, but are not living their lives in subjection to God's calling on their life. People who claim to have been saved, but there's no evidence to those outside the church or their family of the Holy Spirit's actual indwelling in their heart. Okay, so we're going to get right into it. If you look at the first point on your outline, it says, that, um, the first point should say, it's more about your deeds than your dialogue. It's more about your deeds than your dialogue. In the, the first verse, we, we actually went over already in response to the reading. I'll read that really quickly. Titus 1.16 says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and not do every good work. Okay, so there's people that they, they profess to know God. They profess to be Christians. But in works, they deny it. And one, it, it, they're saying one thing, but living their life spiritually in a totally opposite way of the words that are coming out of their mouth. As they used to say, you know, their, their walk doesn't match the talk. Matthew, there's a few other instances of this, described in Matthew 23, verse 14. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, do ye devour the widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Now, the scribes and Pharisees were people who had, if I can use this word, had some spiritual clout back in the day. They were people that were people to be looked up to spiritually, people who were maybe on a little bit of a spiritual pedestal in those days and times. And it says here that even though, you know, these are people who have elevated positions, they, for, for a pretense, they make long prayer. They, they, say, they can use all the long, flowing words. They can pray. And they can have all this flowery speech. They know all the vernacular. They know how to pronounce all the Old Testament names that are impossible to spell. People like that who have, who have all the background, all the training, look the part, talk the part, but it says here they're going to receive the greater damnation because they devour those houses. They're talking one way and living an entirely different way. Isaiah 48, chapter, um, Isaiah 48 1 says, Hear ye this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth, nor in righteousness. And so here we see the house of Jacob. We saw here about the whole, at this time, the whole nation of Israel. The whole nation of Israel, which are called by the name of Israel, Come, come forth out of the waters of Judah. God has pulled them forth, sanctified them, set them apart, but swear by the name of the Lord. That's what they, that's what they live by. That's their code. I swear by the name of the Lord. They make mention, they talk about the God of Israel, but not in truth, nor in righteousness. In short, they're talking all these, all these things, they're saying all these things, but they're not doing what they're saying they're doing. 1 John 3, 18, this is probably the most, well, most well-known of the verses in this, in this particular group up here in uh, number 1. 1 John 3, 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let us not love in word, okay? let's not talk about it, neither in tongue, don't speak about it, but what we're saying about it is more important to God to do those things in our deed and in our truth. Okay, so number one, it's more about your deeds than your dialogue. Okay, that's the distinction between being a professing Christian and one who's actually possessed with the enjoyment of the Holy Spirit. Number two, it's more about your conduct than your claims. It's more about your conduct than your claims. Mark 7, 6 says, He answered and said unto them, well, have Isaiah the prophet, 
So I will have Isaiah's prophesied to you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Okay, so you see here people that, that, that claim, you know, they honor God with their lips, they claim to love the Lord, but what does he say? Their heart is far from me. And unfortunately, sometimes, we all probably know Christians, the distance between what they're saying about the Lord and where their heart is from the Lord, it can, can, be, a, it can that be a pretty big span. It shouldn't be that way if we're actually possessed by the Holy Spirit. But things, you know, it tells us many times in the Bible, out of the bunch of the heart and not speaking. We should be speaking about things and walking about in, in truth and in righteousness. Romans 1.22 says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now this part, I include this verse here, is if you've ever had the, the opportunity to go to maybe a family member or a friend or a loved one, somewhere along the way that is backslidden, and you've gone to them and maybe said, you know what, I'm praying for you, but I'm looking here and I, and I see you, you, you're slipping a little bit. You know, you used to be walking with the Lord and you know, we haven't seen you in a while. In church, you know, you know, you're starting to hear some rumblings about some things you're involved with or people you're involved with. Oftentimes, the first thing is, is they say, well, what are you talking about? I'm fine. They, they might get this real intellectual response of, well, I'm, I'm doing fine. God's taking care of me. I, you know, I can serve God from, from home as well as I can in church. I don't really need to be around other people. They might give you all these things and they might sound really wise, in their response, we're right here in Romans chapter, Romans chapter 1, verse 22. While they're professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Because if you're one of those spiritual discernment, you're sitting there, all stretched in your head, in unbelief, like, you think you're living the right way, and you're foolish. It's clear to see that you're not. And I know those are some uncomfortable discussions to have. But sometimes the most uncomfortable discussions are the most important ones that we need to have. We need to be willing, in love, not go there and take a Bible and try to beat them over the head with it, but go there in love and try to say, hey, let's, let, let's work this back out. You know, let's work this out. God loves you. Get back to where you're supposed to be. Luke chapter 6, verse 46 says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. A lot of people are calling out the Lord, claiming to be He's the Lord over their life, and He's in control of their life, but they're not doing things He says. Not doing things He says. If, if I, this isn't, the thing this doesn't happen to me, but if I'm coming along like um, 390 up here, between here, it's between Mount Morris and Florida, my parents and back. If I go along there and get about Dansville and I'm flying to about 90 miles an hour and I get pulled over by a cop and I go before a traffic judge and say, you know, that's a really good, that's a good law you got out there. That's a good thing. That's a good thing you're trying to keep people safe. About the third time I come back in here and compliment him on this great idea of having a speed limit, he's saying, well, why don't you actually do it? And sometimes I think God is looking at us the same way, like, why are you calling me Lord? Why are you acting like you're, you're going to give me the title of being the person charged in life when you're living however you want to live? And spiritually, we can get to the point where it's easier for us to say the, night, to say the right words than it actually is to get our heart right with God and live the right way. At some point, that judge is going to look at you and say, I'm glad you like the law, but how about doing it? How about keeping it? It's the same thing if we tell God, you know, God, I love you over and over again. In the New Testament, how many times does it say, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. There's a qualifier there. If you love me. If you really love me, keep my commandments. Now we'll have you turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start just a few verses. Verse 21. Very, very, very well known passage of Scripture. Some of you may even know this from memory. But we're going to read it. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, we're going to start in verse 21, and we'll just read through verse 23. 
says very clearly here, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many of you, I'm sorry, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in, in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And now will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in equity. Now, raise your hand if you've heard that, that passage of scripture before. I mean, obviously it's very well known. Now, that's a pretty serious passage of scripture. But if I, if I had to pick out one word here that I would go that goes beyond serious into the scary zone, if I can say, if you look at verse 22, the first word of the verse of, of chapter, two, I'm sorry, verse 22, the first word says, "Many will say to me in that day." It doesn't say, you know, there's going to be a few of you that are claiming to be Lord. There's going to be some, a few of you guys that aren't really saved. It doesn't say, you know, there's about half of you that are going to be saved that are calling me Lord, and half of you who me Lord that aren't really saved. It doesn't say, it doesn't say, you know, 25%. It says, many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? He's just say, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, if we can take it apply to our world today, I think it's safe to say there are a lot of people. If it says many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, there's a lot of people right now who are calling Lord, 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 whose hearts are so far from them. There's a lot of people calling God their Savior who've never been saved. And I'm going to try to paraphrase this and try to apply it to, to our, the things in our own lives. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that name? Okay. Have we not preached? Lord, I've I preached. I've uh, I taught Sunday school classes. I've taught VBS. In that name, we've cast out devils. No, we don't cast out devils anymore. We'll skip that part. And in that name, there are many wonderful works. I've, got, I've visited people in the nursing home. I've, I've, I've ministered to the sick. I've, I've taken care of children in the nursery. I've, I've done all these things. I've served. I've I've been at church, I, I tied, I gave offerings, I, I supported missions, I did all of these things. What's he going to say? Verse 23, I'll profess them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in iniquity. Because if we come back to number two, it's, not a, it's more about our conduct than it is our claims. It doesn't matter what we're saying, it matters to God what we are doing. Number three, on the outline, number one, number three, is it's more about actuality. It's more about actuality than appearance. It's more about actuality than appearance. Proverbs 26, 23 says, Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver drops. Now, if you know anything about um, Pots and pottery. It's actually a very interesting picture and word study. If you ever get the, the opportunity you want to do that, I would encourage you to do so. It's very interesting that the types of pots in the Bible that have specific purposes, pots are used for different uses and things like that. It's a very interesting thing. But when it calls here about a pot shirt, it's, if I could hold this up, pretend this is our pot. We talk about a pot shirt is usually something that has, we think in our own minds, of having a cracked, okay, a cracked pot. Okay? Something that had a, that previously was maybe very fruitful, very functional for a specific purpose, but it's got a crack in it and can no longer be used the way that it was intended or designed to be used. That's how I know what I always thought of that word pot shirt. When I did a little more digging, when I talked about pot shirt, it, it, it's, it's more than just having a crack in it. It's actually being almost shattered and put back together. So it's just really a shell of its former self. So if you can imagine, if I took this and I dropped it and I dropped it and smashed it and got a hammer and banged it, grabbed all the pieces and super glued it, and it says here, Proverbs 26, 23. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot covered with silver drops. Okay, so I break my pot, smash it up, glue it back together. I go to Jess's um, 
arts and crafts stuff, get a little bit of silver, glossy glue, and paint it on there and say, hey, this is wonderful. This is an awesome piece of art I have here. You're going to be like, you've got a piece of junk in your hand, a little bit of that, like, glittery glue on it. But how many times, it, the, the, how many lives, I wonder, are there people whose lives are broken in sin, who walk into church on Sunday, put on a suit, coat, and a tie, their little silver drops, put on a dress or a skirt, and say, hey, I, I, I look good. Isn't that what counts? It's not. Number three, it's much more about actuality, your actual condition is more important to God than the appearance of how you're trying to make yourself look like something you're not. Revelation 3.17 If you want to turn there, Revelation 3.17 says again, another very well-known verse in the Bible Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have needed nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched miserable Poor, blind, and naked. Now, uh, I guess it's probably been a few months, um, but I think of this verse because my my cousin is a pastor in Tennessee, and he told he told me a story about they do their uh, witnessing in their visitation on Saturday, and they went to this guy's house who had fallen into some some really I mean all sin is bad. He got he got himself in some trouble, so much so that his wife. And his kids, like with the kids and left. And beyond that, as if that wasn't enough, he, that wasn't enough of a wake up call for him. He continued in that sin without changing the problems that God was calling in his lives. And I've had similar experiences with my God, it doesn't feel like this, but nothing this drastic is when my cousin told me. But he went to him and said, hey, it's obvious you have. You got far away from the Lord, and look what it's costing you. Look what, look what it's already done to not only your relationship with your wife and your kids, your relationship with your church man, but your relationship with God Himself. And his response was, What do you mean? He, he had his own business. And said, this is the best quarter I've ever had. God's blessing me. Finances coming in. I've got a new truck. I just built a new deck. I've got a new pool. I've got a new riding lawnmower. I've got all, this, all these things. So in his mind, he, he sits here and thinks that Revelation 3, 17, it says, I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. I have need of nothing. God's taking care of me. I'm exactly where God wants me to be. But those of us who are spiritually discerning, good to look at them and just scratch our head and say, you know not that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And that's the problem, is we can get to the point where not, hopefully not even here today, but there's a way, there are too many Christians that can backslide and get away from the Lord and think, you know what, I've got money in the bank, I've got food in the fridge, I've got, you know, God's taking care of me. I must be all right with God. I must be able to, my, my spiritual walk is acceptable in sight. And it's not. Okay. Roman numeral number four. It's more about heeding. H e e d i g heeding than it is hearing. It's more about heeding than hearing. James one twenty two through twenty five says, "But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only." And the part that comes after that is deceiving your own selves. Be ye do be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving. The, 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 the part here that ties in is deceiving your own selves. It makes it very clear here, you're not fooling anybody else. You're not fooling the, the other people that you're walking around pretending that everything's okay when it's not. And you're absolutely not deceiving God. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face and glass. For he beholdeth himself, goes his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso look, looketh into the perfect law of liberty, continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of his work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Okay? Another example of it being more about heeding 
than hearing is in Ezekiel chapter 33. Verses 31 32 it says, And they come unto thee as the, as the people come, and they sit before thee as my people. They hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their consciousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song, as one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. Now, if you've ever had the, the opportunity to go visit somebody or provide to some one-on-one -on -one counsel with someone, this is often the type of reaction you get. They might nod their head and say, you know what, you're right. You're right about that. I do need to get these things changed in my life. Yeah, I appreciate you coming by. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for taking the time. It says here, you're unto them as a lovely song and one that has a pleasant voice. They might show outwardly that they're appreciative. But hey, thanks for taking the time out of your day to visit. I'm glad you're praying for me. Keep praying, all this and that. For they hear your words, but they do them not. And it was in one ear, out the other. No change at all. It's more about heeding than it is hearing. So you might ask yourself, what, and this is one of the basic questions, and I, I try not to, to gloss over this, um, because there are, there are people who claim to be Christians who, if, if they fail to realize one basic truth, they're going to have a really hard time understanding the truth of the Holy Spirit's indwelling of the believer. And that one truth that a lot of people don't really understand is that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third person of the Trinity, of the Godhead. The God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of if I could say this, popular preaching that people play, people on the radio, people that are on the TV, are on the TV or television, there's a lot of preachers that are, are putting forth the notion that the Holy Spirit is really just the power of God's influence in lives without actually being an actual person. And until we make the, 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 I see some heads on here, so I think everybody understands the Holy Spirit is an actual person. If you don't understand it, it's going to be really hard to grasp um, how he can actually dwell inside us. Okay, um, these verses here, I'll go through them quickly. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, okay, what, says, what do you mean the Holy Spirit dwells inside me? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 says, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Ezekiel 36, 27 says, And I will pour my spirit within you. Romans 8, 9, But ye are not of the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Romans 8, 11, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead also shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Romans 14, 17, Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Ephesians 2, 21-22, And whom all building, fitly framed together, groweth unto the holy temple of the Lord, and whom ye are also built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And these verses make it very clear that once we become saved, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. That's the indwelling. We are, like you said, we are possessed or indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And somebody who has never had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is going to have a really hard time being saved. It's impossible. And the hard thing is, there's a lot of teachings, like I said, there's a lot of teachings about the Holy Spirit just kind of being this almost mystical presence that just shows up and does things instead of actually being a person. And I would propose 
you're going to have a hard time trusting in a God that you don't know who He is. And unfortunately, I think the reason why we see a lot of people who claim to be Christians, they have no evidence of the Holy Spirit's dwelling in their heart, is because they've accepted God the Father, they've accepted God the Son, but they've never been taught that they need to accept that the Holy Spirit is part of that trinity as well. So I'd be asking them, so what are some of the evidences? What are some of the indications? What are some of the proofs of being possessed, of being, being indwelled by the Holy Spirit versus being just professed? It shall turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Okay, so the first, if you've been on Roman numeral number one, letter A, it should be a new person. A new person. Okay, it says here, if you're in Christ, you are a new creature. I mentioned earlier that I go to the gym in the mornings, and if I, I'm very much a creature of habit. I like to do my prayer time, I like to do my Bible time at the same time every day. I leave the house at the same time every day. I get to the gym at the same time every day. I don't get home at the same time every day, depending on... I work with preschoolers, so you never know how that time's going to go when you wake them up in the afternoon. So that can get skewed a little bit. But I like to have a schedule. I'm very much trying to be regimented. So when, you, when, I, when I go to the gym in the morning, if you go early in the morning, you, you kind of see the same group of people. And so you kind of get to know them a little bit. And there's this one guy I've been talking to uh, for about maybe a year and a half or so, and he's a music director at another church in the area. And we got talking one day about, you know, testimonies, and how to get saved, you know, all these types of things. And he told me his testimony, and it was quite alarming, because if you look at him now, he's, you know, you look at him, he's a nice guy, he's a respectable guy, and the things he was telling me, he looked at him, I can't believe you were involved in those types of things. And he said, yeah, you know, I, I used to be in the bars all the time, yeah, I was really heavily involved with the drugs. Like I said, he's a music director, so it's, it's, in his prior life, he, he played in a lot of music in a lot of bars and did gates and things like that. So, you know, I got involved with running around with you know, women I wasn't married to and getting involved in things like that. I said, wow, that's pretty, that's amazing. That's an amazing testament that God's working your life in such a way. And, and so, so when, you know, when did you stop you know, the drugs and the drinking and you know, running around? I said, well, I stopped the drugs, but he's like, I still drink. I still go to the same bars about you know, every week or so, Friday nights for happy hour. I'm sitting here thinking to myself, that, that's, that's not a new creature. That's just a cleaned up version of, of, the, former, of the former thing. When you think of, of um, back in Genesis, when God is creating the, the earth and the animals, I firmly believe when God made a tiger, he made an actual tiger. He didn't just pick a cat and give him some extra food and say, what's the tiger now? He made a new creature. One of the evidences of us being a new creature in Christ is it. Now, I, I gotta say that it is young. I gotta say about four and a half years old. So I can't, I can't stand here and say, you know, is it in a you know, preschool that I, I stopped watching certain cartoons or eating certain sugary cereals when I was four? That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But those of you that got saved, if, if you got saved later in life as an adult, you should be a different person entirely than what you were before. So if there's people that claim to be saved, but still live the same way they, they did before they ever got saved, they might not have gotten it. The Bible makes it very clear that if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. A new creature. A new person is what we're calling it letter A. 2 Corinthians 3.18. If you're there, just turn over page. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. If we are really saved, the Holy Spirit is working inside of our hearts to change us. To change us. Um, 
again, there's this, there's this other, like I said, there's some disturbing um, practices that are being brought forth in a lot of mainstream Christianity today, right? A lot of this come as you are, leave, but I, a lot of those come as you are and leave as you are. You come in the same way, you leave the same conditions. You don't get anything while you're there. And it's true that God will accept anybody. God will save anybody. But from the moment you get saved, for, for the rest of the day you got, He is trying to change you into His image. It's not just so if you get saved once, get your fire and turn and say, God's like, alright, that's all I want about you. You're saved. You're on your own. That's not how it's supposed to be. As soon as we get saved, from every, from every step that we take, the rest of the way, God is trying to mold us and to make us to be more and more like Him. Now, the, number two, there, evidence of being possessed versus being possessed. One is being a new person. And number two is new priorities. New priorities. If you turn over to Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verses 2 through 6 say, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law cannot do, it was weak through the flesh, and God sending his own Son in the light of the sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So some of the evidence is that you've actually got the Holy Spirit dwelling in your heart and on your life is one, you become a new person, and two, you have new priorities. Can okay, we see here in verse um, verse five, for they for they that are that do for they that are after flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Okay, our, our priorities change when we get saved. New person with new priorities. Okay, so now, if we become a new person with new priorities, it is manifested by, or is evidenced by, number one, we have power. The bottom of your outline there, number one should be power. There's a lot of verses here. I will actually turn to those. Let's go through these ones um, on my own. But feel free to, to look these up. There's a lot of verses. This, to be honest with you, this is just a handful of verses of the, the Bible has to say about the Holy Spirit's power working in our lives. There's, we could do a much more exhaustive list of verses. The second Timothy 1 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Acts 1 8, when ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. 1 Corinthians 4 20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Ephesians 3.20 Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask of him according to the power that worketh in us. Colossians 1.11 Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power. Isaiah 49, 40 verse 29 He giveth power to the faint. Ephesians 1.19 and when he is, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us work for, to us work who believe according to the working of his mighty power? First Corinthians two five that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. Now I, I mentioned um, earlier that I'm a very logical person when it comes to how to have a scheduled text. Um, so you might think I'm. Uh, really into math and science, but I, I'm not. Um, when I was in high school, I couldn't stand either. I was much more, um, I'm very quiet by nature. That's, my, that's not my nature to, to, you know, it took me a long time to be able to even stand in front of people and, and speak or preach. Um, I always enjoyed English because it was much easier for me to get my words and my thoughts out in written form and on paper than it was for me to verbally give and an answer or a response. It, was, it, it sounds crazy, but it was easy for me to go home and write a term paper with a thousand words where I had time to process and think and to write it out than to stand up and just answer numerically a question in math or science. It was just 
It, it's just kind of how I am. Um, so when I was in high school, I, I, I took chemistry and I was, I dreaded chemistry. I dreaded it. And there's all like this periodic table and all these elements, and it was right before lunch, so I'm hungry. And, you know, I, I don't understand all, any of these symbols or like the NG, and, and like they, they have letters that don't even go along with what they're talking about in the periodic table. Like, what is going on here? Um, so I was terrible at chemistry. But I remember one day, um, like I said, it was before lunch and I was hungry. And I packed my lunch. So the one thing I probably remember for in my high school is uh, the Bunsen burners in chemistry. I tried to make, I had a ham and cheese sandwich. I tried to make it a grilled ham and cheese sandwich with a Bunsen burner and set off the sprinkler system. Um, to, to this day, I don't, it's by God's grace that I passed chemistry. I don't even know how it happened. Um, but I remember one day, it was actually my friend's teacher. If, you, if you're from a small time, you know this, that they know your parents, they know your grandparents, they know your aunts and uncles. So if my mom went grocery shopping, it was nothing for my teacher to say, he's not dead in chemistry. You know, we, can get, we can really get to work. So I had to go in, study halls and after school. And she really you know, tutored me to try to just get me through. Um, and thankfully I did. But I remember one day we had this, um, again, I'm not going to try to say the elements because I don't know what they were. Um, I mean, like, like the example of the Romans, professing myself to be wise, I would sound quite foolish to those of you that know chemistry. Um, but they had this container, and they had these uh, like vice grip things, and then she had each of us in the class, quite funny, just came up, and we all tried to turn that thing, and get, get, get that lid on her as, tight, as tightly as we could. Get it, we, she brought, like, we had this big, um, like these big gloves, we're supposed to get an extra grip, and all these things. We're trying to get on as tight as we could make it so this thing would not come off. We have this big kind of um, column type of container, and she had something in it. I don't know what it was, like I said. I don't know what it was. Then she had a little container of something else. Again, we all came off. We took the period trying to screw it on as tight as we could, make sure it wasn't going to come off. And she had one little tiny hose. Like a, a tiny to like about the about the wither diameter of like a, like a drinking straw. Okay, not a big hole, just a tiny little straw that connected from this little binky container down to this big container that we had all gone up to. It. Twenty some kids in the class were up there getting that thing on as tightly as we can. And she asked us and said, "Now when I pour this element, whatever it was, Kool Aid, I don't know, what it, ginger ale, whatever else she had in there." Um, when I pull this down that tube and it mixes with this other one, do you think it's going to blow the top off or do you think the top's going to stay on? Well, here we are. We're all, well, we've already been up there. You know, we've screwed that thing on as tight as we can. That thing's not coming off. So she had us come up and she said, all right, well, come here. Now you try to get on as tight as you can try to take it off. None of us can move it. This thing was not, was not budging. This thing was stuck on firmly. So we're all sitting here thinking, yeah, that thing's going to stay on. There's no way it's going to blow um, the top off that thing. She put a, a few drops of whatever that was in there and went down a little tube into that container and blew up the, the, the lid off. It just it blew up like, and that thing skyrocketed. We had the, um, like the, the long rectangular plastic lights and it, it shattered that thing, knocked the lights out. So everybody else was like, wow, that's awesome. I see your thing. It's good. I'm not getting in so much trouble for the girl cheese now. <laughs> um, but the thing when when we have power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it's going to come out. It's not going to be this little thing that we can kind of keep in this neatly compressed little box and kind of think, oh, I think I'll use a little bit of power now. If the Holy Spirit's power is in your heart and your life, it is going to come out. You can't contain it. Now, so when we come to new person with new priorities, one of the evidences that that's true in our lives is power. But number two at the bottom of the outline is the other one is it's all one of the other signs is also peace. Peace. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. 
Now does the world give it? Give thy anger unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Philippians 4 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Romans 5 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but be spiritually minded is life and hand. So if we actually really have the Holy Spirit sitting going in our lives, it should be evidence, not by only power, this Holy Spirit's working in our lives in powerful ways, but also we should have a peace. We, we say this morning in Sunday school, I have a peace that passes understanding. If we have that, and the outside world doesn't, that should be evident in how we carry and conduct ourselves in our lives. Thank you, if you will, still, if you look back up the power, I don't have the verses down for these. Um, but when I think of power, like I said, we, obviously you guys have all seen our girls, so we read Bible stories in that. And one of the uh, heroes in the Bible stories, in, in the stories is, is Samson. And we think of Samson being a powerful man. If I'm, I did a study recently on Samson, and there's four indications of when the Holy Spirit says the power came upon him. The Holy Spirit's power. The first time the power came upon him, he killed a lion. And he slew, it says he slew a lion in the way. The second time, he goes and kills 30 men, kills 30 Philistines. The third time, in, in Judges 15, he kills a thousand men with a jawbone of a donkey. Now, he's not out with a bow and arrow or a shotgun. He's got the jawbone of a donkey, and the power came upon him. And then, obviously, in in Judges 16, the last year, Samuel, the Holy Spirit's come, power was on him, and says that he killed more people in his life than he did in his death, and he bowed with all his strength and pulled the pillars down the mountain. Now, if the Holy Spirit's power is so profound that it allows a certain man to kill a lion, to kill 30 other men, to kill a thousand other men, and then to literally pull down the pillars, in, in the strength that God supplied him. We have to realize sometimes as Christians, we have that same power working in our lives. Like I said, the, the, the Bible story we read the girls, it's sort of, it's sort of, they always show Samson as this cartoon. He's kind of this big, strong, muscular guy. Like a bodybuilder kind of guy. But my own personal thought about it is, it says that, you know, the Philistines, they didn't know where Samson's strength came from. Which makes me believe that Samson was probably a very ordinary looking individual. Because if they looked at him and said, well, he's obviously he's a massive human being, his strength must be in his muscle and his power. They didn't know that. Which makes me believe that he was probably not how they portray him in a lot of these you know, children's stories and literature. Because obviously they had to trick the lion into you know, having him tell him that the strength of him because of his hair. But that aside, we have the same power that worked in Samson, same power that worked in Othniel, who's another great character that I say about God's power in him in Judges, uh, specifically Judges 3.10. Uh, Judges 6, um, we see God's power coming on Othniel. Uh, Judges 6, we see God's power coming, the Spirit of God coming on Gideon. And they, they brought great victories. And then obviously in Judges 11.29, there's a story of Jephthah as well. We won't turn there. But sometimes we've got to be careful because we can look at these people and they're all it's Old Testament. It's Old Testament. It's not, it's not me, but it's, you know what? It's the same Spirit of God that worked on them and involved in them. It involves us if we're really saved. And I, please, I, I hope you, you'll understand when I, when I say this. My, my motivation is not to have you question your salvation. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to scare anybody thinking, you know, oh, I made a profession one time, but I'm not really saved. That's not my intent. But if there's parts of your life where you don't feel that you have God's power, if you walk through your life constantly worried and anxious, and you don't have God's peace, regardless of all Jerry looking, regardless of all the claims you make about loving God and knowing the Lord, regardless of everything you're saying about Him, 
If you don't have those evidences in your life, having God's power and peace in your life, you need to get that straight. You need to get that settled. And if there's people that you know who claim to be saved, who say they love the Lord, but they walk contrary to what the Bible says, they don't have God's power, they don't have God's peace, we need to lovingly be able to go to those people, talk with them, and pray with them. And it could be part of the they're having such a hard time where they don't have the power and peace they want in their life. It could be very simply that they're not saved. That they don't even have to we, even in the New Testament, you, there's some question even amongst the Gentiles. Like, they, they didn't know there was a Holy Spirit to come upon them until, until Peter left them. There's a lot of Christians, or people claiming to be Christians, who don't know that God's intent was not just to save them, it's, his intent was to save them and live inside their heart and dwell in them. And that's the only way we're really going to have that true peace and power that we need to live in in such a chaotic and stressful world in society around us. Let's go to the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, just thank you for your word. Thank you for your teachers from it. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for indwelling us, for giving us the power and peace that you try to live through. We can't do this in our own power. We ask for your help, we ask for your uh, guidance, you make decisions. Help us to seek for others about the ones who may be lost or backslidden. to try to bring them into closer fellowship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you. Praise the Lord for us. Make sure we're possessors and not just professors. Then uh, take our hymn books and uh, turn to hymn number 75. Abide with me, 75. Take the name of Jesus. 